The following is brought to you by Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. TotalSeal.com Hello and welcome. Hidden Horsepower presented by Total Seal is back. My name is Joe Costello and we've got another great episode for you. Joining me now, Lake Speed Junior Lake. This one is going to be a lot of fun. You know, there's a, a little race that happens in the month of May, and we've got some cool stories about one of the pace cars we learned at the Engine Performance Expo. Mr. John Callies shared it with us, and we're going to share it with the Hidden Horsepower audience. Oh, Joe, I can't wait. When John was telling that story back at, in January at the inaugural Engine Performance Expo, I was like, wait, this has got to be an episode of Hidden Horsepower. I think people would really enjoy hearing this really unique story uh, about this car and this project and its association with um, that little that little race, a little 500-mile race somewhere in Indiana. Yes. In May, I don't know. So anyway, it's, you know, John was a great guy. Obviously, he's been a guest on Hidden Horsepower before, and so – it was great that the people at Engine Performance Expo allowed us to take the interview of John talking about this special May program and, and, and share it with the listeners here. So I uh, can't wait for everybody to get, their, get a chance to hear John Callies and, and you talk about this cool little project. Yes, absolutely. Uh, remember, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Engine Performance Expo. Of course, Hidden Horsepower, you can subscribe wherever we are, whether it be the Facebook group, the Facebook page, the YouTube channel, or, or otherwise. But in this particular case, uh, we love the fact that Engine Performance Expo has got their own YouTube channel, and you can go digging through all of that content. But before we get too far into it, let's just throw it back to the Engine Performance Expo. John Callies talking about the biggest project of his life to that point under the gun with a deadline high pressure big intensity parts that didn't exist he had to get it done did he get it done let's find out thank you very much everybody um and many people who follow me uh, know that i'm a pontiac guy like i love pontiacs thanks to my dad and we've got a 78 trans am with a 455 the old architecture but getting to talk with john about his time with pontiac motor division has been amazing and john you've made your way over to this portion of the studio and you've had such a great career in so many different areas but we're going to focus right now on something that went down in the early 80s that a lot of people probably remember but do not have any idea what happened behind the scenes and more importantly I think for our conversation how an OE manufacturer relied upon the aftermarket to accomplish a major goal in a short amount of time tell us a little bit about it this is a really interesting and 30 this is 37 years ago and this was June of 1983 uh, Bob Dorn, who was our chief engineer at the time, gave me a call and said, John, we're going to be the pace car in 1984 with the Fiero, and uh, I'd like you to build the cars for that. I said, man, that's great. That's cool. So I called, the next deal was USAC was over Indy 500, and uh, Roger... Uh, Kluski was the tech director of the program. So I called Roger and I said, Roger, what are the requirements? And he said, oh, it's not bad. You just got to go 125 miles an hour and you got to stop in 500 feet. And I hung up the phone and went, oh my gosh, you couldn't, if you dropped a Fiero out of a 747, it couldn't go 125 miles an hour. So now that we knew the requirements, what do we need to do it? Well, there was a fellow Vanderlee, Paul Vanderlee of Vanderlee Engines. Engines. Paul had been doing port work, design work from the flathead days clear up to top fuel. So I contacted Paul and said, look, we have this project and I'd like you to be involved. I want to send you a stock head and you tell me what we need to do. Now the other thing is, I needed two. The factory engine was 110 horsepower. I needed 220 horsepower to get to the mile an hour requirement. So that meant a new head, a new block, 
new crank, rods, pistons, everything. And okay. let's jump in right there. Uh, a lot of people remember the Fiero, and it depends on who you are as to how you remember it. That car broke a lot of ground for technology with its space frame, removable body panels, it was mid-engine. The very beginning of its run, it was what you're describing. At the very end of its run, it was something totally different. And I think this project has a lot to do with it. How much time did you have to accomplish all of these things you just listed? We had six months to get new block, new heads, new parts, and on the dyno at Paul's place. And the fortunate thing was, uh, Hoki Aldecachi was the primary designer behind the car. And the one thing that he did, he made that engine compartment in the back, it could hold up to a V8. <laughs> and of course he hid that because it was five years earlier when you start the project, before 83. And it was supposed to be designed as a economy fun car. And so by five years past, all of a sudden, performance is back. And so Bob Dorn wanted to use the pace car showing that you could have performance out of uh, uh, this Fiero. So anyway, so we, <laughs> we got the first head that Paul did. We put bigger valves in it, changed the ports, and a fellow by the name of Tim Peterson back at Pontiac he did the, cut the head up, did the drawings. This is way before AutoCAD and all this stuff. And so you're doing it all by hand and measurements. And he went over to the foundry, we built new, because we built, we had our own foundry at Pontiac where we did the blocks and the heads. And so he did the, got the tooling done and parts made, and it was like three weeks. It was just amazing what Tim did. So now we sent the head down to Paul. He ported it, did it, and meanwhile, all we had was a lightweight four-cylinder block. And I needed a block that was heavier, bigger pan rails, better head bolts, blah, 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 blah. So another fellow who was uh, on the team was Al Felixa. And Al Felixa was a 35-year veteran of Pontiac. He knew everybody and where every screw was. The plant that built the four-cylinder, they would build 6,000 engines a day. So you say, I want to run this specialty block through there, and they go, hello. <laughs> so we got the, the block the, done, and I went to John Deere because I wanted a high nickel block. So John Deere produced 500 blocks, and, and they were to go for our racing program. Well, the next thing was, when I went to plant 55, they said, well, we want a million dollars worth of tooling. That was my whole program, you know? So I said, well, wait a minute. So Al Felixa, with his 35 years, I said, Al, go over and see all the foremen, all the guys on the line, and ask them, how do we do this? Well, they found all the tooling needed. They set it up, and Al brought over 200 motorsports jackets, gave every foreman, everybody on the line, the guys came in on a Saturday morning, changed the tools, ran 500 blocks, and in the afternoon had it back to production. It was an amazing thing what Al did, and it cost me 200 motorsport jackets. So now I had the blocks. <laughs> so now we had um, Norton Machine do the crankshafts. We used a pink connecting rod from Chevrolet and uh, used that when we use a six inch stroke, so I lengthened the stroke on it. And uh, the next thing is November 1st, Paul had all the parts at his place to assemble an engine. Well anyway, he gets it done and the thing puts out 235 horsepower. I'm going, 6,500, I, I got enough power. So I called Bob Dorn at Pontiac and he said, nobody believes that that's real horsepower. Well, Paul, his dyno was very conservative, but they wanted it to run on the DC dyno at engineering. So he brought it up and put it on the dyno and it made 232 on the DC. And I go, we're there. So everybody in the building was excited about going from 110 to you know 234 or five right there. So I now had an engine. Now the problem was 
the car. I had to put bigger brakes on it. I had to put bigger wheels, tires. Uh, I used Firebird rotors all the way around. AC Delco provided me with uh, an electronic brake booster system. I used an electronic rack and pinion system that they was in prototype on the cars. And uh, so this thing was starting to come together. Well, all of a sudden, November 1st, I got the car ready and I head back to Indy. Now this was a pretty classy project. I put it in the back of a U-Haul truck <laughs> to go to Indy. So we drove there and uh, uh, Roger McCluskey, we showed him the car and he, you know, we had to perform. So it was only 46 degrees out. The track was cold, you know, and so I got everything warmed up and I started running around the track just doing some 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 and came in and we looked over the car and everybody was happy and I went out and ran 125 and uh, did the braking deal and we passed that. Well that, so everybody's happy and I go great. Well I said let me, let me run that speed on all four corners. So I come off turn four and the transmission blows in half. The engine falls to the back I'm going through oil, trying to keep it off the wall because it was my only test car. And then I call up Al Flix and say, Al, what other transmissions do we have? He said, zero. I'm going, oh my God, this is November 1st, you know, <laughs> this is November. So I then, I'm driving back, and of course this is no cell phones before all that. I get to New Mexico, and I find a phone booth, and there was a, there was a fellow that built transmissions uh, for road racing. And he had a little shop in San Francisco. And uh, so I called him up on the cell phone. I said, I'm in big trouble. Can you help me? And he said, I'll look at it. And so anyway, I had Al Air Freight of uh, uh, five speed, which was our next year's transmission to him. Next day, I'm on a plane to San Francisco get him and I'm walking into the shop and it's like dungy one light bulb in it and I'm going and this guy's gonna produce you know help me I, and he, I said did you get the transmission he said yeah it's all filleted out so we go back and look and I said well what do you think he said well the synchros wouldn't make it so we had to go to dog clutches all billet gears and I said that's wonderful but I need a transmission in one month what I didn't know is he was good friends with the chief engineer at Allison Transmission, and they did the backup for him. So I called him and said, I need help. <laughs> and they put two engineers on it with him. And one month later, I had transmission at the Prevent Gallery. We threw it in the car. We have a five mile oval. I beat the crap out of it and I was going to stay together back in the U Haul. And then January 3rd, we're back at Indy. Well, now it's moved up to 50 degrees. So go through the same thing. Everything lasts. Everybody's happy. We come in, and I said uh, uh, to Roger, I said, look, what, last year was the Corvette. I said, what did they run? And he said, well, they ran a, about 133.5 for a four-lap average. He said, well, I said, you mind if I take this thing out and see what we can do? Here we go. And he said, uh, yeah. I said, well, okay. So when I did a four lab average of 36, 136.5. So that was another thing in the, you know, for us, just personal record books to, to do. So when you, we had to have two other cars ready, new cars with all the components. And we went to people like Ray Lipper at Centerline. He built the wheels for us. And you have to realize that when design studios involve, you have to get their buy off on everything. So uh, John Schinella, who was the designer of the car on, for, the, for the design side, John flew out with Mater C. Ray, came up with a theme for the wheel. Ray built them for us. So that was a cool deal out of the way. And then John did the scoop over the hood. And on the back of the scoop, I used a 747 wing light as a yellow light. So nobody had ever done that before, you know, incorporating it in a scoop. So we had a lot of fun with this car. And uh, 
race day they had 13 cautions and what you don't know is you got a guy next to you who's looking at the cars coming up he gets a signal that there's going to be a yellow then he says to you he taps you on the shoulder and he wants you to haul butt because these guys are at 161 so you leave like a drag car i mean you burn the tires your power shift first second third here out on the track so you don't get run over well there were 13 cautions that day and about the 12th caution i'm starting to hear stuff you know i'm worried that something's going to come so undone. So let's take a second to dive mm -hmm. in. You're driving this pace car. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be picked to drive the car. Which yeah. is yeah, fitting, cool deal. given yeah. the pro. So yeah. back to your yeah. story, you're about to get run over. Yeah, and so anyway, we make it in, we get past the 13th uh, Rick Mears won the race, which is Penske's driver, and uh, now Roger owns the Speedway, and he's having all the pace cars redone that he won races at. So the original Fierro's being redone to top position. And uh, it just, uh, I was, guys, I was there for a month. At the end of the month, they had a big party after the thing. I was so wiped out, I couldn't even go to it. Mentally, I was just shot, you know, because if anything had happened to that car, a flat tire, anything would have, ruined the, what the program was we were doing for Pontiac. So that, that was cool, launched us into the full race program. Now on the four cylinder, I just want to make a comment. During our five years of racing the four cylinder, and this is 165 cubic inches, normally aspirated, we went from that 235 up to 368 horsepower at 8,000. So it was a potent little little piece well the, the fiero at the end of its run had oh. your fingerprints all over it well, and now the corvette is mid-engine so maybe you guys <laughs> were on to something well it's unfortunate what happened but the uh the next year the 19 uh the 69 fiero uh, 89 fiero was going to have a supercharged v6 all new suspension it would have been a killer our prototype was done, but the engine got closed out. The whole program got closed out. What, what might have been, obviously, that was a storyline that I was tracking. We just learned so much more. And then through that project, you become the head of Pontiac Motorsports. We heard a little bit about that yesterday. For those of you watching at home, you can find those videos. Um, but in NHRA Pro Stock, in NASCAR, taking less and doing more, kind of like a rapscallion bunch of engineers fighting against uh, Chevrolet and others with less budget, but maybe more desire. Yeah, the, the, the Pontiac uh, engineering group was a very tight group and they just worked their tails off. And we probably had more competition between us and Chevrolet than we did us and Ford. But that's just the territory and the fun and that drove everybody. And uh, you know, we did a lot with not a whole bunch of money. And it was really thankful to the aftermarket as, let's say, Brodex ended up doing the aluminum heads for us. Then they did the V8 small block, big block, and V6. So Brodex was a, a huge part, and Elderbrock did the manifolds for us. I mean, we used everybody. And without their help, we couldn't. This program came together in 10 months you couldn't do all those parts. Well, you realized that to go through the regular channels would have just been impossible because of, you know, let's call it massive corporate red tape. Uh, I understand the reason there's checks and balances, et cetera. You go to the aftermarket people you knew so well, and they could do it. Oh, yeah, I mean, it was, they, they just pulled it off for us. We couldn't have done it without the aftermarket. And of course, luckily, I had been racing and doing stuff prior, so knew these people and uh, you know, I call like I'd call Vic Elderbrock and say, I got a manifold I want you to reproduce for me. Send it to me. You know, I mean, the cooperation was tremendous. Yeah. Fan fantastic. It's a great story. The Fiero, depending on who you are, how you look back, but hopefully now you realize that uh, it was definitely on the right track right at the end. And like you said, performance was coming back. Now, what are we sitting by right here? Because all of a sudden, uh, I know everybody wants to know what's going on here. To me, you know, it looks like a, a Fiat Topolino, but 
modernized for the street. No, by the way, this belongs to who? <laughs> yeah, it's one of my latest projects. I built a car similar in, uh, in uh, 1975. And so this is my 2020 version of, and it's a Simca, which is really the same as a Fiat Topolino, but it was built in France. And so uh, I have a LT1 direct injected. It's stroked to 411 inches, has an eight-speed automatic, independent suspension all the way around. Wow. And uh, so it's a fun little car. So as much as you went through the process of building, designing, panicking a little bit to make a deadline for the Indy 500, all of that, you're still putting yourself through that, yeah, designing well, and building yeah, and... Absolutely. And unfortunately, we got, I got a well-equipped home shop to do stuff. And so this is your personal uh, yeah, cruising around? Yeah, personal fun. Yeah, so this, I've had this car to the wind tunnel, and uh, we are hoping when we go back to racing that we can run the mile, and it'll be somewhere around 216, 17 miles an hour. So, and you're going to go 217 in, miles yeah. per hour in this, John? Yeah, well, I hope. <laughs> the, uh, that's why you went to the wind tunnel, because the wind tunnel shows you, I had to build a bunch of panels and stuff so it didn't take off. That is a, a very good idea. So what would you say for, for folks out there, I'm always looking for lessons, people with machine shops and aspirations, uh, people who are connected into the automotive industry. What are the ultimate lessons from this project that you went through? Um, well, I think it, it's anything. If you're determined enough, want to put the hours in, you can accomplish anything. And you're going to run into some big bricks, but you learned how to go around them. I, mean, I love the fact the you're, you, you were coming down after success and uh, you couldn't even enjoy the big victory right, part. Right, right. That was, a, yeah, my wife wasn't real happy at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but I know, I know what people really want to hear. As much as uh, they love listening to us, they would probably love to listen to this car. Can we fire it up? Sure. All right, you get in there, and I am going to tell everybody who has made it possible for us. Wait for my cue, John, because sure. I'm going to talk about some very important people like the folks at Rottler. Now, uh, obviously, this whole thing, we're talking about machining and uh, machines, folks at Rottler stepping up big time, but as well as Morell Lifters. Ed Morell and, of course, John working together for Lifters. And Ed, thank you very much. Morell Lifters doing a great job. And uh, these are companies that when you need what they produce, please remember what they have done here today. Total Seal Piston Rings, the leader in ring seal technology. Total Seal just put up a brand new website. They have revamped uh, everything. They're revamping even at this moment. They produce the Hidden Horsepower podcast that Lake and myself have been telling you about that you can subscribe. And it's really about increasing education on ring seal. You can spend a whole lot of money on a whole lot of parts. If you don't have ring seal, it's not going to uh, maximize what you've spent. Folks at CWT Industries, Randy has been amazing. He's got one of the lines of the week so far with an angry little baby in his hammer, but uh, CWT doing a great job. Also Higgins Performance, thank you very much Higgins. Samtech.edu, the next generation, where are they coming from? Where are they getting their foundational education? Uh, Judson and Linda and Brian Massengill over there down in Houston, Texas area with Samtech doing a great job. Thank you so much. Edelbrock, we just heard a story about Edelbrock being on the cutting edge and being flexible. And that is so true. Yesterday we talked a little bit about how they've innovated with certain engine combinations that didn't always have the most aftermarket presence. So thank you, Edelbrock. Also, uh, Qualcast, thank you for stepping up and supporting the Engine Performance Expo. Comp cams yesterday, Billy was insane. And I, you know, I'm just meeting Billy and of course I take a shot at his Seminoles, but that's okay, it's all in good nature. But we learned a lot about their, uh, their new designs and their involvement with those record runs that Clay Milliken had a couple of years ago in Top Fuel. Holly Performance, thank you very much. Holly, speaking of electronic fuel injection, really stepping up. Folks at Melling have been involved. The videos, Lake and the guys at Melling yesterday, great stuff that's in our archive. Elgin, thank you so much. Driven Racing Oil, very much appreciate you guys being involved. Of course, Lake being a oil guy. Promax and Turn to Vice from BBD Performance. You guys have stepped up and we really appreciate you. And now, Let's light it up, John. Let's hear the sound. Let's go 200. the 
Simka, John, that was incredible. He's flashing signs. He's having a good time. The Fiero 1984 Indy 500, it couldn't get better than that. And that's why you're watching the Engine Performance Expo. John Callies, they got it done. And just to hear him recount the step-by-step -step and how the aftermarket saved the day, to me, is the moral of the story, right? Like, they weren't a fleet of foot enough. They weren't flexible enough. So he went to the outside vendors, and they got it done. Oh, it's incredible to think, uh, yeah, the, you know, behemoth that General Motors is that these rogue guys, like this, you know, band of pirates, you can imagine within the company, you know, working with the aftermarket to create all the parts and pieces to build this car. I, I still can't get over him driving that pace car and what the pucker factor had to be <laughs> <laughs> shifting gears and doing all that knowing yeah if you slip up and mess up man there is no replacement there's no backup you got the one bullet better work i mean the, the amount of pressure in that situation is incredible that's what i love about that story it's like there's it's this one little path every there were so many things that could have gone wrong and this whole thing could have been a disaster and been terrible but instead, it's this thing. And, of course, uh, I'm, I'm talking a little bit out of school here. You know, Kevin Studaker, one of our tech guys here, he's a Fiero guy, and he thought that whole story was fantastic. So it's kind of cool, you know, to be able to come kind of full circle and all the different aspects that it actually touches. So um, glad we could, we could share that with the listeners today. Well, it, not only that, but uh, let me, you know, everyone knows, I think everyone knows that I've got a 78 Trans Am with a Pontiac engine, that I'm a Pontiac guy. And when the Fiero came out, it was um, it was cool, but also got panned. It was uh, beneath its potential, but it had big time potential. And, you know, now when people think back about the Fiero, I don't know what they think, but that was a groundbreaking car and kind of set the the pace for that space frame superstructure that now they all are using where the body panels are kind of applied, just, you know, put on there. Uh, and it makes a lot of things uh, much easier now that we got the mid-engine Corvette. You think back to it, and it was just un it was just underpowered. And Callie's fixed that problem and had said at the very end that they had got all the suspension components and they got that thing ready to be the beast that it should have been from the beginning, right as it was getting killed at the very end, which was a little bit sad. But at least they got there, whether it was released or right, not. Exactly. Yeah, just one of many yeah, the great same, stories. Same LV, right? Life, you know, life has that way of sometimes those things that you thought were almost there, about to really reach their potential and really come into their own. And it just, whatever happens, I mean, the winds change and it goes away. But it was great to hear, you know, the John story of working with the guys, you know, going in these and telling these guys, hey, let's do this. And they were going to do it in the weekend. And, the 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 effort the pride that people put into that program that's what makes it cool to me i'm like yeah that beer was an awesome car now that you look at it knowing what went into that story well absolutely yeah that's what makes it neat and uh i actually have seen the car pretty recently i did an episode of uh, a, a television show called magnificent machines and we went to this um, motorsports museum or an automotive museum in uh, Melbourne, Florida. The gentleman's name Mark Pylock, and he's got Lake. It's a very impressive collection of everything. But one thing that he has is every pace car that has uh, paced the uh, the Indy 500. Wow. And I remember, oh yeah, it was incredible. I'll share photos with you next time we're together. And uh, everybody, you you can uh, look it up, Mark Pylock. Anyway, bottom line is I saw the Fiero and I was like, wow, look at that. And I was studying and I was kind of geeking on the Fiero prior to this. And now to learn all of the work and the effort that went into it. And this guy has it, it's there. Uh, uh, just amazing, amazing stuff. Now, is it the one that pace that John drove that I don't know for certain, but I still think it is very impressive. Even the air scoop over the top, having those Indy cars breathing down your neck, a lot of reasons to have that quote unquote pucker factor, but uh great stuff. Another great one. Yeah, it was Joe. And, and hopefully the hidden horsepower fans are subscribing, you know, here, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, you know, they're going and joining the Facebook group. And they're, they're doing these things because this is what we're doing. This is our passion, right? 
and you know, obviously John is like he's the pioneer, if you would, you know, almost a godfather of the Hidden North Power family, not even knowing it because it's his kind of passion and devotion is what is inspiring and what we all kind of work with. That's the whole great thing about the Injury Performance Expo is that you had guys like John and Warren Johnson and Doug and all these guys there and they're, and they're talking and they're sharing back and forth and it's made for a community within the community, if you will. And how many people are really into what we're doing here and what they're, what they're seeing here. And uh, that's, what's cool is that we see that there's real benefit of, you know, just how would you have thought a podcast could create a community and then that community is inspiring each other and they're doing great things. And uh, it's just really kind of cool to see what's coming out of all of this. Absolutely. I, I agree. And that uh, makes it very rewarding and worthwhile. But in the end, though, we're trying to make power for people and you guys are doing it. So if they're building an engine, we're talking, uh, you know, street engine, bracket engines, client en- engines for customers, all the way through NHRA, Stock Eliminator, NASCAR, uh, Formula One. You know, maybe we've got some Formula One people out there who are interested in piston rings. Who knows? Uh, where should they go? What should they do? Hey, we make more than just racing stuff, too, Joe. I was working on the gapless set of piston rings today for an air compressor. So it's that's the thing about Total Seals that we mean, obviously, the racing stuff. That's our passion. We love it. We do it all day, every day, and would never want to do uh, not do that. But the reality is the lessons we've learned from this, we can apply that to an airplane, to a compressor in sitting in the field or in a submarine or who knows, right? So that's what's cool is that if you've got a piston, we can probably make a piston ring for it. We can make it better. All you got to do is pick up the phone, give us a call, 623 627-7400 587-7400 or go to totalsealed.com and send us an email. We have a request a ring uh, feature on there that asks you the pertinent questions and it comes in and then we'll take a look at it. We'll get back to you and we can build a ring set to fit your application, to help you go faster, make more power, live longer. Just like that. He's Lake Speed Jr. I'm Joe Costello. Lake, great job. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it as always. More episodes of Hidden Horsepower are available on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You only have to subscribe to one and you'll all get the same content, but it all depends on where you get your podcast. My name is Joe Costello. You can follow me at WFO Joe, like why freaking open. Joe on Twitter, on Instagram. You can always hear me right here on Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal.